I'm Brownfield's Megan Grubner. With us today is April Hemis, an Iowa farmer, uh, the demand committee chair with the United Soybean Board. We get to talk demand and exports today, which is a really cool and fun topic uh, when we get to talk about soybeans. Well, exactly, especially when it's 60%, over 50% of all the soybeans we grow are exported. So it's a huge commitment of U.S. farmers to produce that high quality crop to export to the world. Let's start first and talk a little bit about what makes uh, U.S. soybeans so marketable on the global market and, and for customers around the globe. Well, it's that high quality like I talked about, you know, the, the lack of foreign material in the soybeans and the high quality. So what we hear from our customers when we go on visits overseas is, you know, they have to process it less. They're, they don't have the color issues like they have with Brazil. Beans are a little bit more red from their soil, so it's less processing. And the higher amino acids in there, so it makes a much better feed for hogs and chickens. So we bring the whole package. It's a great protein package. When you talk about the quality, um, and you mentioned uh, the coloring, which I think is always an interesting topic. What? Why are are the, why is the coloring for U.S. soybeans better, and why does that matter in terms of uh, marketability or demand in other parts of the world? Exactly. So what what we you know because we just raise the beans and then we you know ship them off. But when you're talking to these um, crushers and manufacturers, of them, whether they're making oil or meal, especially oil, you know it's another process they have to go through to get the color out or things like that, where the U.S. soy, they can just crush it and bottle it and they're good to go with other processing. But it, it's it's a money saving thing for them. So as, as long as you want to be the, you know, bring that great product to market, lower cost, plus we have that U.S. sustainable, you know, uh, logo they can put on there. So all of us, the SSAP Sustainably Assurance um, protocol so they know that those soybeans are raised sustainably in the U.S. and they can put that on a label for their customers because all over the world we're finding now that that's what customers and consumers are asking for. Where are the soybeans raised? How are they raised? And is it in a sustainable manner? And we have the best story to tell there. Talk to me about kind of the, the mindset. You've been farming a couple of years. A couple, 39. <laughs> How has the demand and export growth changed in those nearly four fantastic decades of farming? Isn't that amazing? So I look back and we, China, you know, four, 40 years ago, we would have never thought China would be our biggest customer by far, by over half. So um, so U United Soybean Export Council started working there 45 years ago, building that demand, building that demand, and now we have it. So we realize that's a big customer, but we're looking at other places now. Southeast Asia loves our meal, um, the EU, um, and, and places like that. And then, you know, we got a bunch of farmers together and it's like, you don't realize Nigeria is one of the fastest growing populations. So there's Africa. So we're looking at places where we can get into those markets to export. So, cause we know China isn't always gonna be there and Brazil's the low cost. So, I mean, a lot of them look for the lowest cost maybe not the highest quality. So those are the kind of markets. I just found out yesterday, Vietnam has just exploded for U.S. soy. So it's fun to find those new markets and what we can do with our products there. You bring up China, which I think is always an interesting story. How important is it that we don't put all of our soybeans in one basket, in bas in in one one bushel. Ba in one bushel <laughs> or one container exactly. to export, but that you diversify and look for those those next gen markets uh, as well, right? And that's what's that's what's great about um, the uh, the United Soybean Board is when we got together, and this was probably five or six years. It was before the tariffs, right? And we thought of that. We asked ourselves that question: What next? What what next after China? You know, so where can we really diversify? And we decided to focus on Southeast Asia because that was an easy place for us to go and they lo already loved our soybeans. So for farmers to have that kind of foresight, you know, to step back and take a look, listen to experts, you know, what they think and then where we wanted to go. So yeah, we have been doing that. And, you know, like I said, we still can't ignore China, you know, because they are huge to us, but 
we have to look at the what's next and where soybeans can go next. And exports aren't just the whole bean. We're, no, we're that, looking at other elements as well. So with the with the growth of renewable diesel and s sustainable aviation fuel, with those new markets coming on, so what that is is they can use our soybean oil and just replace it with regular petroleum for renewable diesel. That's what we're. It's different than biodiesel. So with that, you know, it's really switched. It used to be the meal drove the the bean price now it's the oil so now these crushing facilities are coming on for the oil and 80 percent of that bean is meal so what are we going to do with all the meal and um and uh, exports are a really big part of it so we need we need places to export the meal because it's different than a whole bean export and then the facilities overseas to be able to accept that meal and there a lot of them are looking at containers you know, for the smaller markets and then the big shipments. So it's really an exciting new place where we can add that value here at home and then ship it out. Also, another export with the meal is let's let's feed it to our hogs and chickens here at home and poultry and dairy. We use a lot of it. And then that's a value added we can export with uh, with the meats. I would assume that export growth uh, obviously comes large in part with investment from checkoff dollars but I would assume as well strategic partners and those who can help market and export, uh, find, help find new markets and develop yeah. markets uh, moving forward. How does that relationship work? So it's great. So we have um, United Soybean along with American Soybean Association. So ASA, that's the policy part of it. Um, Cause in checkoff, we can't do any policy stuff. But what they get is the federal funds, the foreign ag service, FAS, the MAP money with market promotion and things like that, ag market promotion, AMP. So there's a lot of different federal dollars that get funneled in along with our checkoff dollars. So in combination, you know, we use those dollars and work with partners like United States Meat Export Federation and then USAPEAK, the, the um, poultry side of it. So we have a lot of great partners that work together. I just got to go to the Panama Canal in Colombia and get to see those projects at work where the people in Colombia love our U.S. meat. They know it's safe, it's a high quality, you know, seeing whole pork loins in places with, so it's been, it's been great to, it, and fun to see all that and how it really, our checkup investments that we make really pay off in other countries. You mentioned trade missions. Um, how critical and what what role do those missions play in growing export demand for U.S. soybeans? You know, before I started all this, it's amazing, but we do these and um, they always want to talk to the farmer. They love all these people, no matter who it is, if it's a crusher or whatever, they want to have that discussion with the farmer and hear about what we're doing on our farms, how we're doing it, you know, things like that. And just to have the conversation with the farmer. So that never, that, that just never ceases to amaze me on how much they want to hear from the American farmers. Uh, one of my favorite comments was in China and it was the Kerry Group, a vice president, it's a huge, like, largest soybean importer. And um, I was talking sustainability when it was first coming on. He said, just stop, April. We know the U.S. farmers are the best in the world. <laughs> just tell these people that GMOs are okay to, to eat. I thought, my work here is done. So, <laughs> but that's, you know, the, it's just fun to hear them all over the world love to talk to farmers. So when you talk to other growers, whether it's in Iowa, whether it's at meetings like Commodity Classic or any of the other meetings that, that you might be at, if they have questions about why, what are my checkoff dollars doing? Why does that matter in this export game? What yep. do you tell them? I'd say, do you know any other product? So we do ROI, return on investment, and for every dollar that gets put into the checkoff, $12.34 is returned to the farmer. In, in one way or another. And that's just amazing to me. So that's the great story we have to tell, you know, and it's from domestic to export. So, I mean, it's it's split out between categories, but that is a great story we have to tell. It's like, we are really doing good things with these. And it's from the dreaming of, you know, what, what next, what if, to um, legacy projects we have that we fund, that we know are doing good for every farmer.
Every life, every day. That's what we say with soybeans. Just if you want to know anything else, go to unitedsoybean.org and um, and get your questions answered there. April, thank you so much. You bet. It's been a pleasure. I'm Megan Grebner with Managing for Profit, a content partnership with the United Soybean Board on Bramfield.